Well, I imagine most of you were filling out your jobs at CZ uh, applications as that was going through. Uh, absolutely super, super cool. Uh, our next speaker is really one of our most distinguished leaders here at Stanford. Steve Quake is somebody that has started more fields than people in this room have written papers. And I don't know, is Russ Altman in the room? He's not. All right, good. I can talk about him. So Russ has a great uh, line about Steve that he says, and if you invite Steve to give a talk at, at a conference, be careful because he'll take it super seriously and he'll put together a, de a dedicated talk that will then launch a one or two billion dollar industry. So uh, and that's happened multiple times at, at, uh, at this conference in the past. So it's a real pleasure and treat to have Steve back telling us about the Biohub and sort of his vision and Joe's vision for where this is going. Steve. Thanks, Carlos. Well, I'm in the nonprofit world, so no new industries to be launched today. Um, <clears throat> but I will share with you a couple of calculations I did recently about what's motivating some of the things we're doing at the Biohub. Um, <clears throat> so Corey told you a bit about uh, who we are and what we're doing. I'll, I'll give you a little more information here. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit medical research organization, and we are a, a separate organization from CZI, separate governance. And so if you've got a great idea for what you want CZI to fund or a company for them to invest in, I'm not your guy to talk to. Um, <clears throat> and don't email me, please, about that. <laughs> I'll tell you later what you can email me about, though. Uh, we were uh, founded last year with a $600 million gift from uh, Mark and Priscilla, which we're going to spend down over the course of 10 years. Uh, we had a, additional support from Reed Hoffman and Michelle Yee. Uh, and uh, our main, uh, we're a bricks and mortar institute. We're based up in uh, Mission Bay in, in San Francisco. Uh, we're going to grow to be about uh, 80 full-time employees over time. We have a satellite facility here at Stanford, uh, right next to the hospital, uh, not too far from here, and we're in the process of getting one set up at Berkeley as well. And as Corey told you, uh, you know, our mission is to bring together the three universities of the Bay Area here uh, and uh, try to help stimulate innovation in science and technology development. And we're pretty excited about doing that. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we phrase our vision of the mission is that we're going to focus on understanding underlying mechanisms of disease and developing new technologies, which will lead to actionable diagnostics and effective ther therapies. So we're very much on the front end of the whole mission statement. We're not doing uh, translation, clinical trials, things like that. Really focus on basic science and early technology development. Um, and we've kind of... Uh, uh, divided up our, our budget into roughly into thirds. Um, and so there's three different ways we're going about uh, uh, trying to accomplish this. And the first is uh, through our investigator program. Uh, so about a third of our budget is spent funding faculty at the three universities to work on their riskiest, most exciting ideas. We had a uh, 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 an application process we went through last fall and winter. Uh, more than 750 people applied. We uh, announced the 47 uh, awardees a couple of months ago, and uh, and we're letting them get down to work. It's 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 been incredibly exciting to see what they propose and what they're working on. Uh, and you know, although we you know are spending a lot of effort <coughs> encouraging people to work together, part of the the fun in the investigator program is it gives people the latitude to go hide in a corner and work on what they want um, uh, that people don't think is going to work, that can't be supported through conventional means. They don't have to convince other people. They can just get down to it, show it's going to work, and uh, hopefully transition into uh, uh, federal funding. We do ask them to come by and chat with each other uh, every couple of weeks, and, and we're thinking that's going to lay the foundation for interesting collaborations going forward. Another third of our budget is spent building technology platforms that are uh, uh, going to be shared among faculty at the universities here. So for people who want to use cutting-edge technology, stuff that's pre-commercial, not out there yet, where they're not experts in it but feel like it might help their science, we're making that available to faculty at the universities. And I'll, I'll describe those in a little more detail in a moment. The final third of our budget is spent on our internal research programs. Uh, we've got two uh, major projects or themes we're pursuing. Uh, one is the Cell Atlas, which Corey told you a bit about. The other is the Infectious Disease Initiative. And I'm not going to get into great detail about what we're doing here, but I'll just say we're also using this as a mechanism to create an alternative career path for young folks in science. People who want to do science but don't want to write grants or teach classes, be in the university, uh, uh, just prefer to be at the bench and run a small group. And, and that's how we're sort of structuring that. Um, <clears throat> We uh, got our investigators together uh, uh, about a month ago for the first time. That's the group of them there. It's 50, uh, almost 50 folks. And uh, it's been, uh, as I said, 
really interesting to hear what they're working on and see where they're going. Uh, this for us is something where uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of a gamble. We're not you know, sort of micromanaging them. And uh, we funded a really diverse set of folks who are working on, on, uh, on science and engineering that goes way beyond our internal projects. It, people working in environmental ecosystems, working in uh, network computer science, uh, and sort of uh, microbiology. Uh, and uh, it's just, uh, we hope gonna lead to some great discoveries and also great interactions and collaborations as the group gels together. As far as the platforms go, uh, uh, we've decided to invest in five broad technology platforms. One is genomics, the other is advanced optical microscopy, uh, third one is data science, fourth is genome engineering, and finally bioengineering, which we're pulling together optomechanofluidic engineering all into sort of one group there. And so for each of these areas, we've hired a group leader, a uh, platform leader, and they're building a small team, uh, and they'll be uh, shortly sort of rolling out announcements to the universities about uh, how we'll interact. The, uh, the first one we'll be rolling out will be genomics, and we're hoping to get that, um, some information about that out uh, later this week or early next week. And this is something which, uh, as I mentioned, will uh, enable access for all faculty at the three universities to, uh, to, to, to get access to. Um, Corey talked a lot about accelerating science, and that's something uh, that we believe in too, and we're trying to figure out how to implement that in, in the context of the Biohub. And uh, after a little bit of thought, we decided uh, probably the best way to accelerate science is to try to accelerate dissemination of results. Um, conventional publication uh, often delays results from uh, nine to 24 months, uh, it, it can be a real slog to get through uh, uh, the editors, reviewers, and want you to do irrelevant things often. Uh, and this creates you know, a really substantial delay in communicating science. And all of us who are practicing scientists have felt it. And uh, if we eliminate these delays, we can accelerate scientific discovery by a substantial amount. And I'll give you an estimate of that in the next slide. Um, and <clears throat> the way we're doing that is through uh, BioArchive. So we're asking all of our investigators, and they've all agreed, as well as our scientists and the people who use our platforms will agree to this too, uh, will agree to post preprints on BioArchive when they submit their paper to a peer-reviewed journal. Um, and we know that this works. Uh, this is something that's been part of the culture in physics for many decades. I did my doctorate in a theoretical physics department, and back in the day, it was before the internet existed, we would Xerox our papers, our preprints, mail them to each other by post. They were racks where these <laughs> mailed papers would be uh, sitting in every department, and we'd know what everyone else was doing uh, before uh, publication through this mechanism. And with the advent of technology and the internet made sharing uh, uh, something that could be done more easily and more broadly, uh, it's really a cultural choice, not a technological question, and we know that it works in some scientific cultures. And it feels like now is the time in biology. When Joe and I called up the uh, uh, the investigators to tell them they've been awarded uh, the investigatorship. Uh, we also told them they had to do this. Uh, and amazingly enough, half of them said, well, I'm already doing that. Uh, there's no change in their practice. Uh, the other half said, more or less, well, I've been thinking about doing that, and maybe this is the time to start doing it. A couple of them said, what's bioarchive? And so we educated them about that. But uh, it really feels like this is a, a tipping point in the culture in biology, and, uh, and uh, it's gonna be a great thing for the whole field. How great will it be? Um, and how much faster uh, can you make science go? Well, if you let alpha be uh, the time from publication of a result to the next discovery that that result enables, um, that's the amount of time you read something in a journal and say, wow, that's amazing. It sets you off working on something and a little while later, you have a discovery to publish yourself. Um, Delta is the publication delay time. So when you've got your discovery, you send your paper in, and by the time the next person is able to read it, that's Delta. And they're roughly the same amount of time. Let's say 18 to 24 months. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, you need several discoveries often to get to a major breakthrough. Very few breakthroughs in science happen in a vacuum, and they build on previous discoveries. And so if you need n of those things in a row, then the total time to wait for a breakthrough is n times alpha plus Delta. Now, if you eliminate the delay uh, and people are reading things on BioArchive, uh, the acceleration is roughly twofold, okay? Because alpha and delta are comparable time scales. And so that's pretty amazing. To accelerate times twofold, anyone would take that, right? 
Um, <clears throat> now, but this is just the simplest possible model. And you know, if you think about something a little more realistic, suppose every time you publish a discovery, it inspires two people, and they go off and each have their own discovery. And really, honestly, if you know, <laughs> if uh, if you think what you're trying to communicate is not going to inspire at least two people, you probably shouldn't publish it. Um, <clears throat> so. <laughs> Each of those two people go off, do their research, each of them publishes something, that affects two more people, now you see it's growing exponentially like a tree. So all of a sudden, uh, the fold improvement is t two to the t over two alpha, uh, or roughly speaking, after 10 years, you've accelerated science by five-fold. I mean, it's really a staggering number, and this is sort of the power of the community coming together and sharing with each other. And we'll see what happens. It's an experiment for us, and we're really excited about it. Um, let me tell you about some of the people who are helping us do this at the Biohub. Uh, we have a great scientific advisory board. Uh, Rick Lifton is the president of Rockefeller University. Sangeeta Bacha, who's a distinguished bioengineer at MIT. Bob Tijan, who's a former president of HHMI and current faculty member at Berkeley. And Don Ganim, who runs uh, uh, Global Infectious Disease at Novartis. We have an advisory group with one member from each university. Russ Altman from Stanford, Jennifer Doudna from Berkeley, and John Weissman from UCSF. Uh, Peter Kim is leading our infectious disease project. Uh, uh, Lubert Stryer uh, came aboard to run our investigator competition. And uh, Joe and I uh, are just trying to uh, keep the whole thing on the rails. Um, we report to a board. Our board of directors is Mark and Priscilla, Reed Hoffman, who's the co-founder of LinkedIn, uh, John Hennessy, former president of Stanford University, Corey, who we just heard from, and uh, Joe and myself. Now, where is it all going? <clears throat> this is my last slide, um, <clears throat> and you get a little dessert. Uh, so let's talk about one project in particular, the Cell Atlas. Uh, we think it's going to provide a really valuable resource for cell biology. What's the impact of that? We think it's going to have enormous applications in understanding cellular hierarchies, stem cells, and regenerative medicine. And so what will it mean in turn for those fields to be successful and enabled by that? Well, I'll remind you of uh, Richard Feynman's uh, chalkboard in his office after he passed away in the upper corner there. He had written on the board, what I cannot create, I don't understand. And so uh, to be successful, we think in these fields, people are going to have to be creating things, not just understanding what's happening in nature, but creating new things in nature. And how best to communicate that? Well, <coughs> uh, you know, my son uh, shared with me a video, which he tells me is the coolest YouTube video going around Terman Middle School right now. And I think it encapsulates the answer for the question. Now, the AV crew has been making heroic efforts in the back, and hopefully I won't have built this up for nothing. Uh, let's see what happens and whether we can get this video to fly. Dolly the sheep, right? Thank you.